Hello there folks, you're joining me on the secret side of the mighty Pontcasuffly aqueduct today and I just want to talk a little bit about selling my boat and uh, some of the fun and games surrounding that and generally how I feel about doing the process once again. So this is the fourth narrowboat transaction that I've been involved in and uh, I'll just get back to you in a moment as uh, this path is not quite as substantial as I was hoping it would be. <laughs> as I was saying, I've been involved in four separate narrowboat transactions at this point. So that's of course buying two boats and then selling those two boats. And I just wanted to share really a few of my thoughts and maybe some of the lessons I've learned along the way. Now, I'm going to start by saying something that might surprise a lot of people out there because it goes against the advice that even I myself have given out to other people. And that is that during all of those four transactions, there's not been one single hull survey. So that's the survey to see what the condition of the boat's like below the waterline. Obviously, that's a pretty key feature of a boat that it's watertight and uh, hopefully in good condition. Sorry, I'm just trying not to uh, slip down here and end up filming the rest of this video from the, water, from the river. There's a couple of reasons as to why neither myself nor either of my buyers decided to have hull surveys carried out. Now, obviously, I can't really speak for them, but I can certainly say for myself, it's because we were dealing with boats at the much lower end of the price spectrum, especially compared to what you see some of these boats going for today. So, perfect example, my first boat was only a small boat, 30 foot long. It had already had some hull work done and it only cost me £11,000. Now, £11,000 is a huge amount of money, don't get me wrong. But the way I was viewing it was that it was buying me something that I intended to live on for years to come. And in fact, I did live on that boat for four years. So to me, £11,000 was a great buy. It was a steal at that price. And of course, spending 11000 rather than, say, 40000 on a narrowboat meant that I then had some degree of money in the bank, not much, admittedly. And of course, the option of other financing means if there were problems with the boat that needed sorting in a hurry further down the line. Whereas I don't know if I would have gone out and spent, say, £50,000 on a boat and not had a survey done. Another thing that I think ties in greatly with this, and these boats being on the sort of lower end of the spectrum to begin with, is that I was completely open with people when I was selling the latest boat in saying that I was looking for a quick sale because I want to get out there and buy another boat and to me I would happily take a lower offer to not have a survey done and just get the transaction sorted so of course this then creates I wouldn't say necessarily a gamble situation but a calculated risk situation let's call it where obviously people could come to me with lower offers I could think hmm that's too low because even if the boat does need work doing, you're still getting an absolute bargain. Or equally, I could be in their shoes thinking, well, let's, let's give him a low ball offer and then that's going to make up for any work that needs doing. So if we spend X on the boat, but overall we're prepared to spend this amount on the boat, if we give him this much, then the difference between those two figures will hopefully pay for any work if, say, the hole wasn't in great condition. And so again, it's just this thing of working out, dealing with people, interacting basically, and deciding a price that works for both of you for various reasons. So although I would still advise anybody to get a whole survey done, it's something that if I can get a boat at a price I think is going to be cheap enough to still make it worthwhile if I need to spend thousands on the whole, then I'd say I'm still prepared to do that. Fair play, my friends. I'm not sure how official this path actually is, but anything that requires you to jump over a miniature waterfall is, uh, well, it's my sort of place to be, we'll say that much, as it passes into the River Dee and heads to England. So something that I really want to take a moment to stress the importance of, possibly as the most important element of the actual process of selling a boat, is safety and security. Now, if I use Facebook as a starting point here and say, if you've ever sold something, say, like a laptop on Facebook Marketplace, you may well have experienced what I've experienced, which is, as soon as that advert goes live, you'll get 
an unbelievable amount of scam messages that are ultimately trying to make you post it without accepting payment and who knows what on earth the game is because I don't give them the time of day personally. Whereas selling a narrowboat is unlikely to end in you putting it in a jiffy bag and posting it with the Royal Mail. It's important to take that baseline that there's a lot of people out there who don't have good intentions and may not be dealing as fairly as you would like or expect them to. Now, my concern when it comes to actually selling a narrowboat, especially in a case such as selling mine, where it's out on a relatively rural canal at a quiet time of year, so there's a lot of the time that there's just nobody about. And yet here I am posting pictures of my narrowboat, exterior, interior, engine, etc. So people can see everything about the boat. And then if they get in touch with me and say they want to come and view the boat, I'm then giving them the actual location of that boat where they can then look and go, well, there's this, this and this that we can steal off the boat. Uh, there's going to be nobody around because look, he's got it in the back end of nowhere, etc, etc. So of course you can try and uh, combat some elements of that by mooring up near friendly other boaters, etc. But of course, there's only a certain amount that you can really protect against. And I'd say, not only is there the risk if you're posting photos of a boat that's got some very fancy, nice looking stuff on board, and it's clear that you're not living on that boat while it's up for sale. But I'd say my biggest fear was always, what if somebody takes the boat itself? And some people might laugh at the idea of somebody stealing an arrow boat that can travel at four miles an hour. But it really does happen. I know of multiple cases of it happening. And equally, there's cases where people have stripped the boats from the inside out. And there's cases where people have taken the boat itself to hide it away downstream somewhere and try and quickly change the paintwork to completely disguise the boat. So there are genuine risks out here. And it's not the sort of stuff that is as sort of light-hearted as the idea of a low-speed canal police chase might first uh, entail. And let's say another simple example for my particular case here. I've just been away to Scotland for a week. Anybody who was watching me online would know, oh look, Dan's hundreds of miles away. And if I hadn't have already sold my boat, then there'd be people out there who knew exactly where my boat was, exactly what was on it, Again, luckily, I didn't have any kind of real value on the boat. And they would also know that I was hundreds of miles away. So even though I had a rudimentary tracking device on the boat, even if I'd have seen that boat was on the move, it would have been 48 hours or so before I could actually get to it, which again, would have been plenty of time for that boat to have disappeared out of the water somewhere, to have been completely stripped inside of anything of value or who knows, even after the paintwork started to be stripped and obviously damage and potential work that even if you recovered the boat, it's going to cost you a lot of money to deal with. So making appropriate arrangements for your own personal safety and security, or if you're ultimately not comfortable, just biting the bullet and putting it for sale through a marina brokerage and letting them take a certain percent for the service could well be an excellent idea, I would say. Well, my friends, I've just been editing these clips together while I've been recording them out on the beautiful banks of the River Dee in the shadow of the Pont of the Aqueduct. And uh, I didn't realise how long I'd spoken on both of these two topics. So I think at this point I'm going to end this video here with the sound of the white water as hopefully the river level starts to drop and we get some drier and drier weather into the summer. And I will simply say thank you so much for tuning in. I've got a load more boaty stuff to come. Hopefully that will include buying a boat in the very near future. And uh, well, if you're really curious and really want to help me out, please do check out my short boat life books available for the Kindle and as a paperback. And uh, as we cross over this lovely little bridge here down to one of my favourite places where the waterfall tumbles down into the River Dee, I will simply say thank you so much for tuning in, my friends. I hope you've enjoyed this sort of more relaxed style of video. I just wanted to put something out there, just talking about selling the boat, really. So there's just a few things I wanted to say. And, uh, well, until the next time, my friends, have an absolutely fantastic day. Keep it interesting. Keep it boat-worthy. 
and of course my friends farewell